Okay, so let's start for the last session. So we saved the few best stops for the And okay, so we uh, now have uh, Rainer Blatt here. And he will talk about some new developments going on in the Pinsburg group. Thanks, Peter. First of all, let me join the people and thank the organizers for putting this together and for inviting me. Is that okay with the microphone? Is that uh, okay? Good. Thank you. Uh, thanks again. And uh, the title that was originally advertised was the one that uh, Marcus Miller was talking about. So we changed gears, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about recent experiments on error correction and ion photon entanglement. So this is the menu for this afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to bri briefly remind you on trapped calcium ions for quantum information processing. That can be very short because here are all experts. Then I would like to show you how we do quantum error correction with trapped ions. And uh, then I would like to show you also how to do this now in a different paradigm with measurement-based quantum computation. And in the second part of that, I would like to talk about another requirement, uh, how to scale the system up. That is how to uh, connect to nodes using ion-photon entanglement and eventually how to generate ion-ion entanglement. All of this happens at the University of Innsbruck, of course, in conjunction with the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And here are our sponsors. So let me just start by showing you the trap that you've seen before. It's by now known as the Innsbruck trap. This is the linear trap. And we have a string of ions there that we routinely laser cool and address with single, ion, single lasers. Somehow this is uh, reverberating. I'm not sure where to stand in order to avoid this. Is that better? I can do that too. I'm speaking too loud actually for this audience. In any case, so this is, uh, this is what I call a knife edge trap, and these are the ions. And we routinely observe resonance to resonance from chains like that, typically between uh, 4, 5, up to about 14 in the old trap, and newer traps we can go up to about 40. Okay, uh, so this is the setup. And just to remind you of the, the qubit that we have, this is the 729 nanometer transition. This is the S to D transition. We usually call this an optical qubit. And of course, this is the transition on which we just monitor what happens. Quantum state measurement if the system is in the down state. That's what we call the logical one. Then we see light, fluorescence light right here. If it's projected into the D state, we don't see the light, the typical quantum jump detection for the system. Remember, uh, this is so just a sigma z measurement. I'll come back to that a little later. Then, of course, that two-level system, of course, resides in a harmonic oscillator. And uh, synonymously, I will use either spin up, spin down, excited state, ground state, or the logical zero or the logical one, depending on uh, what I'm talking about. The internal states, these are just denominating the internal states of the two-level system. And the motional states are always referred to as the levels n of the harmonic oscillator with the draft frequency nu. The quantum toolbox then consists of a sequence of single and two qubit gate operations. And usually, if according to the old Sirac Solar paradigm, we would, this would be sufficient as a universal set. We would just have, say, a sequence of single qubit and two qubit CNR gate operations, as uh, given by a compiler, for instance, uh, where the CNR gate operation has this truth table in order to realize any and arbitrary algorithms. In the meantime, we have seen that we can do better gate operations. We've seen the wonderful results by David Lucas this morning uh, using Mermesernsen gate operations, or the variant is just a different basis, sigma c, sigma c operations. For that, <clears throat> in conjunction with local operations, uh, yet collective operations because they're just done jointly, and with local operations that are done in an addressed way. This provides us with a universal yet overcomplete set, and we have to run compiler versions to do that. I won't have the time to go into this, but this is by now standard tool in our laboratory. So we just put these things through a computer and find sort of an optimized sequence of these gate operations of our toolbox in order to realize now the quantum algorithms. And I'll show you some examples. So the toolbox essentially, in a summary, is then comprised of the entangling gate operation of the Milner Sorensen type, which we do with the bichromatic excitations. And the shorthand notation is x s squared, because it's a two photon transition, as you know. And uh, this is our entangle operation, entangling operation. Then it's the resonant manipulation that we could do with a global laser to all of these ions simultaneously. This is just shorthand notation with x, x or y, depending on the phase that we do, and the, the tilting angle theta that we have here. 
<coughs> and finally, the, as, uh, the address operations is an off resonant excitation. So that we just call, of course, AC stark shifts. And these are, of course, shorthand notation sigma C. These are the three important uh, tool, uh, <coughs> tools that we use in order to realize our quantum operations. And I'll come to a few more during the course of this talk. Just to give you an idea, typically we get fidelities on the order of about 99% and a bit better for the collective operations, single qubit C rotations, certainly better than 99%. The member turns and entangling operations depend on the number, but for two to three ions we have 98%. For more ions it's a little less. Uh, roughly we lose a, bit, a, a little less than about a percent per ion if you want to give a rule of thumb. So for 10 ions it would be still a fidelity of about 90%. Uh, give or take. Why is that minor? This has to do with the geometry that we have in the system. You see this is uh, drawn at an angle for this apparatus. And the reason for that is that we still have a, a beam which is oblique with, re with respect to the trap axis for historical reasons. The newer traps that we have des designed have an axis that, uh, that have a beam that really goes on axis. That's part of the story. And then we have a Gaussian beam which is elliptically shaped to uh, ensure uh, uh, illumination, uniform illumination, but that cannot be guaranteed. Very often the outer lying ions get a little less throbbing frequency and there's some errors here. This is the reason usually for that and then there's some addressing errors and uh, if it adds up the whole uh, error budget. We are working on that continuously, but that's about roughly the number that we, we take if you just want to get a rough estimate how this is, how this scales at this time. So let me come to error correction. Error correction, we have seen that already in some talks today and yesterday, uh, requires a protocol which is called the redundancy protocol. Of course, due to the no cloning operation, no, no cloning theorem, we just can not really copy the quantum information. So what we do instead is we encode this by using GHC state. And the GHC states, of course, are then uh, done with two C not get operations. So we encode them in a GHC state right here. Then decoherence or whatever error can happen, we provide two additional ancilla qubits which are sort of prepared in their ground states to calculate the syndrome. And from the syndrome, we actually then can design an operation with which we just uh, change the qubits right here, depending on the outcome of the syndrome, and then the error is undone. But of course, you have to reset this, uh, the, these ancillas. This is where <clears throat> you just dissipate your, uh, your, your errors, and then uh, you, just, you can start all over again by doing this. This is the uh, gen gen generic way of doing error correction. Uh, keep in mind that this requires, of course, Toffoli gate operations. These are uh, controlled, controlled not operations. And where this is an open sign, that would be a zero controlled. This would be one controlled. So this is one one controlled, one zero controlled, whatsoever, depending on the outcome. This is final the final measurement doesn't really matter. It's just a yeah. projection. You want to go to the zero right here. <clears throat> OK, we did not implement exactly that. But what we did is we instead tried to implement a, a more generic procedure, which is somewhat simpler. It requires only three qubits, the ones that we need in order to encode the GHC state. And we use them then after the error has happened, happened to decode what kind of error really has happened. So this is fine. We can do that. But of course, then we don't have any spare ions that keeps the information going. So we have to re-encode the, the information uh, just in case we want to start over. So this requires only three instead of the five qubits, but of course the repetition, when we just want to repeat it, uh, requires only re requires re-encoding. This is where we have, again, of course, state preparation errors, things like that. For the five qubit error code, you would not have that, at least, at least not to that extent. But this makes the system simpler, and you see already the generic code is the same. You just entangle, you disentangle, and then, of course, you just information. The syndrome is right here, and you do a toffoli gate operation. How do we do that? <clears throat> now, here comes in our, our algorithm again. You've seen that, the two gate operations right here, okay, uh, encoding and decoding right here. But the dominant errors, and I didn't have the time to show you that in our system, are not flip errors. They are defacing errors, like from a, the magnetic field, <coughs> inadvertent measurements. And for this, we take into account that there's, for instance, uh, so if we, if we can uh, uh, go to a different basis by adding the Hadamars, and then this is just correcting for Z errors. You can just uh, uh, go back and forth between these. So let's just draw the Hadamars here and there before we uh, decode that. But now, for our compiler to work, we just have to compile 
to give, you have to give it some degrees of freedom. But the others then follow the following. We could have had, if there's, say, anything happening in front and after the error that's completely uh, <coughs> commuting with the error, the error couldn't care less about that. So we just could add any operation, a dummy operation, uh, that gives us a degree of freedom for the program. Uh, it could vary things. Then in the end, you've just said that we need to reset the ions. They, they could be in any state because we don't care what the state really is, so there's any unitary there too. So that gives us some degrees of freedom for the, uh, for the optimizing pilot to run this. And once we then do it, uh, of course, we have to reset our qubits right here as well. And then we get the procedures. And all that does it, <clears throat> we use optimization procedure that's actually a, music, a modified a gradient ascent algorithm. <coughs> Excuse me. So we use that grape algorithm, modified the grape algorithm, to give us this pulse sequence. Then you see uh, immediately this boils down to a single C not uh, a single uh, member Sorensen gate operation of uh, uh, the duration pi over four. This is uh, the, the simple C not uh, the simple member Sorensen gate operation. Then the error can happen. You could have guessed that because that is simply entangling all lines. But then. The rest of that is not intuitive anymore. I don't know how to reverse engineer this. This is just what the algorithm gives us. But it boils down to having one, two, three entangling operations, four local, uh, yet global operations, and one local operation right here. This is a very short sequence. And this does all of that that's given here, so the two C knots and the Toffoli gate operation. And we tried to do this and to, to see how this works in, in, a <clears throat> in the experiment. Of course, we have to reset here, and let me just talk about that reset procedure. Remember, we encode the system here, the minus one half state of the upper state. This is the log logical zero. And the logical one is the S one half state down there, uh, the minus one half state of the S one half manifold. Then there's a spare state. We just can uh, map that population right here down to that state, then shine in a short laser pulse, and then it decays <clears throat> to that state, so we reset this. During the reset, of course, we scatter some phonons, we scatter some photons, but that leads only to about a percent of phonons uh, increase per reset. And since the Mimmer-Sorensen operation is not very prone to, not very sensitive to the uh, uh, motion of the system, we can do that um, <coughs> without any danger. So this is optical pumping that does the reset mechanism essentially. Now we are ready to do a repetitive error correction. So let's start out with that system that we want to protect. So this is our qubit. And uh, this is then what we encode. And we have the ancillas into the logical one states. Remember, the logical one state is the ground state that we have here. Then we encode, first of all, everything in superpositions. That's what the plus signs and the minus signs uh, are showing here. Then the error can happen. The error cannot happen only on the first ion. It could happen on any ion. And then we just apply our procedure. We should correct. And then we repeat it twice. This is the idea what we want to do. <coughs> And this is how it looks like. The first thing that we do, we want to characterize how well does the system behave. So we just try to do process tomography. How well does the process actually uh, uh, do in the system? First of all, we have to see how the identity is really made. And keep in mind, in the end, the process is, of course, error correction. We are just looking for the identity that gives us the fidelity of the system, because we want to keep it. Uh, if we have no error and we start just by state preparation and doing this, then, of course, the identity process gives us something like 97% in that, in that system with an error of about 2%. Then we have a first application of this pulse sequence and the reset, and then we just characterize things again. If you do this, we find uh, even if you apply errors or without errors, whatever there is, it's always 90%. So the error that apparently happens can be completely undone uh, within our limits. Do you need to hide the, the first qubit during the reset? Uh, no. This time, uh, for the for the. Uh, you scatter two photons. <coughs> we we hide. I, I'll come to the hiding process later on. But uh, here, uh, uh, you don't know where the system has happened. We we hide all three of them. You just uh, you reset only uh, uh, or, or, or if you hide the first one. Yes, you can do that. Uh, but in, in the in the end, it doesn't really matter where the system happens. We don't measure. I, I show you that. Perhaps I didn't. Uh, perhaps I can show you here. The, uh, during the reset, you have to reset the, uh, uh, the, the the ancillas. That's fine. And then we have to re-encode. 
This is what we do here. So we don't have, uh, <coughs> but hiding is, 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 is there, yes. Uh, but the point simply is uh, that this works, uh, there's, there's no measurement if you were to, uh, asking about that one. You're not measuring anything here. It says it's a coherent uh, undoing of, of what we did there. Okay, no, that, that's fine, okay. The photon scattering is just done here on, the, on these two. And this one, okay, this is, this is hidden. I probably didn't show that. In any case, so we can repeat this now and uh, without going through the details, the errors can always be re uh, corrected for. The only difficulty that we see here is, of course, that whenever we have to repair the system again and again, in each process we lose about 10%. This is what we call spam errors, state preparation and measurement errors, uh, where the measurement is uh, the, uh, uh, the reset. Uh, other than that, this procedure seems to work fine, which really means we can correct for the errors without really doing a measurement. I was confused with that one. Uh, measuring the ancillas and then the, the syndrome detection. That's not what we want. We want to keep it in the dark and want to get going all the time. So this is a, a coherent correction process, uh, which goes also much faster than simply taking measurements because taking a measurement would really take a long time. And that reset cycle here, that takes only about five microseconds. But let me just summarize these things. If we just now look at the process fidelity, ideally this would be one, and we just go, that would linearly go down uh, with the error probability P if we just take now the data as we have it and simply wait, we get disappointingly the green curve right here. And I'll show you that in a minute. And the, the, the reason for that is the following. We have a higher likelihood for having two, photon, uh, two, uh, two uh, qubit errors here in the system than for single qubit errors. And the process that we have is geared up only for correcting single qubit errors. What's the reason for? Uh, correlated defacing. Remember, we are correcting for defacing. Now, I didn't have time to show you that, but we have seen in earlier experiments that due to the fluctuations of the magnetic field of the quantization axis there, then we have common fluctuations to all of these ions because there are coils that determine the quantization axis. And the current, which fluctuates uh, to, to about 10 to minus 6, of course, gives a certain correlation in the noise, and that cannot be undone. There's a higher likelihood for having two uh, qubit errors, as you can see in that inset, that, that we call a correlated noise, than for having uncorrelated noise. Now, how to do uncorrelated noise? Uncorrelated noise has to be introduced, single qubit errors, so that we are sure there's only a single qu uh, qubit error in the system. This can be done by just randomly shining laser, systems, uh, laser pulses into the system. And if we do that, then you see we could break even here in this at least area, so the system really behaves as a quantum error correction should. So this is a bit unfortunate. This is it's good on the one hand that we can undo these things. On the, um, on the other hand, of course, it's a really a bit a, a big drawback that we cannot correct yet for correlated noise. And I don't have a good routine for that. You have to uh, go through that. Quite possibly, one would need uh, a few more ions to undo that too uh, to get these things done. But that's that's uh, still under discussion at this time. But just talking about uh, uh, <coughs> how to introduce the uncorrelated noise. This is simply done by just uh, perturbing the phase of that part, which is in the ground state right here of the system. So we just shine in, say for a few microseconds, that laser, and uh, <clears throat> then optical pumping, or essentially phase, dis phase noise, uh, destroys the phase, correl uh, correlation, uh, fa 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 phase information right here. And then that's how we really introduce these errors, uncorrelated errors. And we can actually determine the error rate by just uh, 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 changing the time that we shine it in. That's how we measure that. But this can now be done and uh, induced in a different way, just to make clear what this really does. Let me give you that uh, idea by just showing the hiding pulses uh, Jürgen was alluding to. We have another way of adding to the toolbox this hiding pulses. So for instance, when we do want to do, to do some measurements right here, but we do not want to affect other ions in the system, what we can do then is, of course, we can use a pi uh, pulse right here on the ground state and hide things in the excited D state manifold. So for the, the time of the system, the system lives about a second in the D state. For the short, for a short time, this the co coherences can be stored in that upper state, and we can shoot, say, a laser uh, at 397 through all of these ions without affecting these. This is what we call hiding pulses. And when we do now the following, we can, for instance, take uh, here our state, encode it. We could hide, for instance, the ancillas. We could make a measurement on the first one right here, unhide that and decode. Then 
in our case, we actually assume that we can undo all of these things. And uh, even if there is a measurement in terms of quantum jumps, you see here the typical Poissonian uh, system that we have for a short measurement time. So the, if you don't see any light, the system was in the D state of the measurement right here. And we're, if you see the light, the system was in the S state. So the point simply is that we hide here this coherence then in the quantum memory. And we apply then a projective measurement, observe the quantum state right here. And the idea would be to retrieve it the, the, from here, the coherence again, decode and undo what happened here. Does that work? And uh, it works in the same way as before, because the encoding is just this part. The hiding part is, now I told you about this, is this part. Then the measurement part is simply shining in a laser through this and observing the fluorescence. That's what we observe here. And then the, we decode and correct. When we just see then the, the process matrix of the measurement, we see this is exactly sigma c. Either we see the identity or we see sigma c, the system has flipped. We see the system in, down, in the down state. So we see it's up or down, but nothing else. This is projective measurement. What does it tell us? A measurement of this kind is actually a complete dephasing. It's not a spin flip. It's not an X operation. It's a complete dephasing. And uh, this is why we actually <clears throat> can undo it. Even if we uh, do this as, as a measurement, we get information about where the first ion really is, in S or D, because we have really projected it. We see the quantum jump, and we can undo it. And you can actually see here now how this really works. So we just hide it first. Then if you don't see the light, uh, then the system was projected here. So we see it here. If you see the light, the system was projected there. And with the error correction, we can really resurrect the quantum state. Uh, this is, again, the identity process matrix uh, with F, uh, the fidelity of about 90%. And if it was in the S state, it's only about 87%. And the reason for that is that, of course, in the D state, the system is perfectly well hidden, whereas in the S state, there could be some scattered light uh, lead to some uh, uh, excitation because this takes a long, longer time and we are employing a recooling process in the meantime so this is somewhat less but this is a technical reason in principle uh, this works uh, without the measurement to about 93 percent and uh, on the order of about 90 percent here which really means we can resurrect the system even if we observed it that's the catch there's no catch but the point is do we get any information from that diagram What's the likelihood of, of, of observing now the system in S or D? Do I get any information about the quantum state? No, I can't, of course. Of course I can't because the quantum state is encoded in three ions. Once I hide the two, the <coughs> coherences are there, I project it and there's a random result. And if you just go through this, with 50-50% likelihood, you get either the S state or the D state. There's no information that you can retrieve from that measurement on the quantum state other than the fact that you have projected it, that's it. Uh, but then you can actually retrieve the state. And we did this uh, <coughs> even uh, by looking at the full process matrix. So we just look here, uh, the, the, sorry, for the uh, full, uh, the state tomography. So we just look at the, all of the coherences that you put into the system. And if you measure, of course, we collapse some of them. Then this is in the, the D state. So we see these, the coherences are left there. And this would be in the S state, this is the other coherences. But when we just uh, decode things and, uh, uh, and really correct for it, we find the full state tomography as before. Uh, slightly more errors right here, but other than that, it's the same. And the, the fidelities that I've shown you before are derived from these state tomography results. <coughs> yes? Uh, Reiner, when, when you scatter a photon, uh, the ion can end up in a different state. So the other spin state or the ground state. That's right. Do you need to repump it before you correct? No, we don't repump it because we rely on the fact that the member <coughs> uh, you mean a, a different electronic state? Yes. Uh, no, the different electronic state, uh, the pulse is long enough to do op uh, all, the, all the optical pumping there. The, 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 the scattering uh, happens on the, the S to P transition, mm -hmm. and we, we apply uh, uh, light sufficiently long that it gets always repumped to the S1 minus S1 half state. We, 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 during the measurement, that, that's automatically done. So there's, but there's not deliberately. It's part of that is always pumping because we apply the right polarization. Yeah. Okay. So much for this. Uh, let me just change gears because I'm running out of time already here. Uh, speaking of measurements, measuring 
in quantum physics can also be used to do a full quantum computation. This is the measurement-based quantum computer by Rosendorf and Briegel. Whereas we usually have these circuits and have the computation procedure as I outlined before uh, in terms of these circuit diagrams, in a measurement-based quantum computer, you would start out with a fully uh, entangled lattice, for example, in this case. And uh, the computation procedure consists of making um, measurements in a superposition basis as indicated right here, and then you feed forward in order to implement one and two qubit gates. This is, was proposed by Rosendorf and Briegel and was realized later on in photonic uh, implementations. And uh, this is the diagram that we took here from that part. So you just take measurements and the, the arrows indicate that the measurements in the X or Y uh, uh, basis or and these ones in the C basis and so forth. And that's uh, then giving you the pathway through the the uh, uh, the entire lattice and in the end that's what remains is the result uh, loosely speaking uh, that gives you uh, the, the measurement based quantum computer that's why it's also called the one way quantum computer because it's not reversible in this case now what do we need for that in order to do this we need cluster states cluster states are a particular class of craft states and cluster states have a 2d square lattice structure craft states are usually more general what do we mean by that uh, we have vertices in these graphs, and we have, of course, nodes, the, uh, the, vertices, the, the edges. The vertices are the qubits that we prepare in certain states, indicated by the arrows right here, and they are usually prepared in superposition states. And the edges are here uh, just gate operations, so it's control C operations uh, that we know of this kind. And if you do that, then you just make the appropriate measurements, starting from there, and uh, just go and proceed as... Uh, done by Hans Briegel in this, in this work. And if you really want to know more about these things, I uh, advise you to look at this tutorial. Now, what would we need to do? We create our cluster states, of course, with entangling operations. We do not use the control C operations, and we use our memo and gate operations this, this kind. What we usually do, we entangle, for instance, with four uh, ions, every ion with the other one. So we just get the lines drawn all over that. However, for the cluster state and the lattice structure, we would need this kind of entanglement. So how do we achieve that with four ions, for example? And the procedure to do that is the following. You just have a half of a Milmer-Sorensen operation, so this would be pi over 8 right here. Then we have, for those ions that we re whose uh, interaction we just want to cancel right here, we have a local operation right here and right there. So initially we start with that. This would be the fully entangled case, but it's not yet fully because it's just Milmer-Sorensen over half, over 2. And uh, then we have the local operations right here, which switch the phases here and there. And then we do another Mimmer-Sorensen operation, uh, or the inverse, whatever you call it. This is uh, months about the same. Then uh, you get this kind of a craft state. This is the way you produce it. This is actually very nice, because if you look at it in uh, more detail, you find that this is a very general procedure. And this can be generally applied to give, give you graphs of this kind, the linear graph, the, quadruple, the, the, the quadrant graph, or with five ions, three in the center. So these are the graph states that you really generate with exactly that sequence. So the sequence is simple, and it can be scaled up to larger numbers. That's a good state. Now, what do we do with that? Now, first of all, we want to encode, for example, a state. Remember, encoding a state is measuring in a certain basis. And uh, then the outcome of the basis then tells you what state you have encoded. Then in the end, they have redundancy built in here. There's, say, in this case, five qubits redundancy. And uh, they would give you enough leeway to correct for all the errors in the end by making the right measurements. In this case, it would be x-bit flips that we measure uh, in the C basis. And uh, finally, we correct and do a state readout on, the, on, on the, this ion number, uh, level B in this case. And uh, this is now in essentially an implementation of uh, carrying over information from A to B via all of these C, N qubits in the center. And if you just look at it, and this is how Briegel and Rosendorf uh, uh, describe it there, this is essentially a teleportation processes of the information in A via C, N to B. And this is why we use teleportation fidelity also to actually De describe and to evaluate how well this really works. The equivalent circuit diagram would be like that. So you start off with psi, you have a number of redundant uh, 
a uh, number of qubits for to store your redundancy. Remember the ancilla qubits that I've shown you before in the error correction protocol. You have the encoding, the noisy channel, and the decoding, central measurement, and the correction. Essentially, it's the same thing, but this is just built in here in the measurement basis. This is the equivalent quantum circuit. So what's the correction capability? If you had only once bare iron in the center, of course, then you have no correction capability. Think of it, if you just measure that one, it just gives you a random outcome, and you don't know which error syndrome is there, what do you have to correct here? If you have three, then you can correct, in this case, for one X bit flip in this case. But remember, you could also do this for C uh, errors by just going into a, the appropriate basis by adding Hadamard's. And with this kite, a kind of a code, this is a 7-qubit code, then you could correct for up to 2 x bit flips or 2 c bit flips, depending on what basis you're using. So this would be the good part of having it. Then we do that, and we just now uh, have this kind of encoding, 3 ions, 5 ions, 7 ions, and we deliberately introduce errors right here. Right here, or in this case, two errors that we could do. We get the following results. This is the average teleported state fidelity, so this is again teleportation that we do in this case, and this is the error probability. In this case here, we see that the error probability goes down as indicated theoretically because we cannot correct for errors. But if you add, an, if you have an error here or two errors there, then you see all the errors can be corrected for very nicely within our spam error uh, result. So this is roughly about 90% that we can keep it. So these are the bit flips that we introduce. How do we do that? We do not actually do the measurements and then do conditional operations in the experiment. In order to really get through this and to find out what would be the optimum way of having these feedforward things, what we do is actually characterize the entire system by making measurements here and then making all the measurements that we build up all the entire truth table of the entire system. It's 128 cases in this case. And uh, then we just do post-selection to see whether what the, what the optimum feedforward could possibly be. But in fact, if you really want to do this in the process, you would have to electronically determine what's the outcome of the measurement and then proceed for the next measurement, which we have, which we know how to do when we did teleportation with the usual circuit diagram, but we didn't do it here. So this is done via post-selection. You find more results if you want here. But what if we do now add more errors right here and see how the error probability goes down? Theory tells you this goes down uh, uh, linearly for this case, and then there should be a slight correction probability for uh, more numbers. So if the code length gets higher, you should protect the system better. But of course, after 0.5, there should be no, no correctability. And this is exactly what you find. This, these are the data. The blue line is the one that corresponds to that one, the red one to this one, and the black one to that one. Now, if you're looking, first of all, what you can see is there's a slight improvement. I wouldn't really call this very significant, but I think th there is some improvement. The longer the code length is, and there's serious errors happening right here. We are really applying phase errors all over the place, or flip errors uh, for all of those. And it indicates, at least, the longer the code length is, the better is the correctability that you uh, can achieve in the system. So this is another way of, of doing these things, and we really uh, train with that how to encode these things in longer and longer chains. Again, I'm running out of time, so let me just change gear again and uh, give you a few other results towards scalability. We have seen that several times. This is the old uh, Dave Vineland idea, uh, published in the paper by Dave Kuklinski and others, how to scale up an iron trap by uh, just segmenting it and then uh, using various segments and uh, various path, uh, memory regions, operation, re interaction region, and so forth. And this is how uh, Dave and Diddy and others in Boulder really envisioned that. This is how it should look like. Now, there's many other ways of doing this, and we won't have the time to go through them all. So, for, instance, for example, you could just make an atom-photon interface using photons for networking and then cavities to have a photonic channel right there. There could be trap arrays, iron wire solid-state qubits, Hartman is probably going to talk about this. I'm not sure whether you're talking about this, so Hartman will talk about that. And uh, there's also dipole-dipole coupling. We have heard talks from, from Boulder. Uh, Andrew Wilson was talking about this, and uh, this is also ongoing. But uh, let me just give you some recent ideas and results from what we've done here. This is the photonic channel as it was envisioned by Jeff Kimball when he talks about this quantum internet. We want to have ions as a quantum memory inside the cavities, 
and the cavity itself serves as a quantum interface just to uh, interface the quantum information of the ion to that photon that uh, leaves the cavity and goes to the next one. And the fibers then are used as the optical, uh, the photonic channel. We have seen already remote ion ion entanglement in the group of, Dave, uh, of uh, uh, Chris Monroe some time ago. Also, teleportation has done has been done that way last year and this year by Gerd Rempe. And we've also seen, also seen direct state mapping from ions to photons and then again to ions, also in our lab. Let me just give you a few ideas how this works. We have such a system. This is our ion trap, which is uh, vertically aligned, and this is the cavity axis. So what we have, we have mirrors sitting right here. And again, these are the, the trap electrodes, and the ion is sitting in the center, and that's now coupling to these mirrors. And uh, what we do now is the following. We just have the system sitting as that. These pins are just uh, indicating where the trap really is. I have uh, omitted the, the trap electrodes for clarity. What we do now, we do Raman excitation on the S to D transition right here, where the yellow path is always the cavity path, and the blue one is the driving path with the Rabi frequencies as indicated. So that creates a horizontal polarization if you just go to that D state right here. But if you do this now on a different transition, we could also create a vertically polarized photon here going to the D prime state. That would be a bichromatic excitation. With this, you can actually create a fo ion photon entanglement of this kind. So we just get the, D the prime states and uh, linked with these vertical and horizontal uh, photon, uh, photons that we generate in the cavity. And this is also tunable then by the Raman conditions. Details don't really matter, but in fact, we can choose the phi and we can also choose the amplitudes and, uh, and the phases uh, to our liking. When we analyze the entire result, of course, we do the same thing again by process tomography and look uh, then how we just do when we change the phase in the system. Then the quantum state tomography of the joint ion photon state as a function of the phase is here. And we see that this wonderfully uh, goes and that the fidelity is always, uh, as indicated, that the, the, this, the fidelity is always about 97% roughly. And we can actually calculate concurrence on also how much we violate a clauser horn shimony holt uh, inequation inequality. And uh, with this, we know that we can actually entangle ions with photons with very high uh, probability. This actually can now be used also to map a state. If we have an input state, for example, which is on, a, on an ion right here, and we start out with an empty cavity in such a way that we now create a superposition of uh, photons as indicated with the same amplitudes. This would work in the following way. We prepare our state in the superposition state right here, then we apply, again, uh, two blue laser beams and the bichromatic excitation, and we generate these photons in the cavity. And then uh, for each input state, we measure the three output bases, and we just do a quantum process tomography to see that the mapping works. And uh, without uh, going through all the details, again, we find that the mapping process works fine uh, with a high fidelity of about 92%. So we can really map then uh, the input state to an output state, the input state and an ion to an output state of light and can transport these things over large distances. Now this can be used then to really build up a quantum network. And this is something we wanted to uh, extend by using say two ions. So if this is the cavity right here and you have two ions sitting uh, jointly in that same node right here, then we can uh, generate two entangled ions in the optical cavity by they sharing a single photon here in this case. But also, if we had, for example, a quantum computer in the way I've shown you before, like this, then we can just slide in ions and out of that, uh, that node and likewise do it the same on another end. We can just generate entanglement over a large distance in the same way by having the efficient remote entanglement of the kind that I've shown you before. These protocols can be done. And uh, this is the idea uh, how we want to do uh, eventually distributed quantum computation. Let's see how we can do that. So let's start out again by the ion photon entanglement. Remember, this is the cavity that we have right now. It's the intermediate coupling regime uh, in the cavity QED terms. And again, we have this bichromatic cavity-mediated Raman transition. Remember, these are the blue beams, and these are the, the cavity paths that are provided here. Then, of course, we create that state. So this is a photon, uh, uh, ion photon entanglement right here. Now let's have two ions. Then we do the same thing twice. 
So we just have this for ion number one and ion number two, because the ions are sitting here in the same node, or at least in, in pretty much the same nodes. And then we just uh, look at the photons that come out and what happens. We want, of course, to measure indistinguishable photons. The photons that are uh, coming out, we don't know whether the photons are from ion one or two. And then we project those three possible states. If you observe both horizontal polarizations, we know from the protocol that we ended up in these states, both these states, so this is uninteresting, we discard that. If we see both vertical polarizations, we also discard that. But if we see either uh, vertically and the horizontally polarized photons or vice versa, then we know we are ending up in exactly that superposition. So this is then entangling two ions by that measurement that we take here. Of course, that gives us only an entangled state with the prob probability of one half because we discard these these, these probabilities right here. And now we have to make sure that, of course, the ions are really indistinguishable. For this, we want to make sure that the ions are talking to the same mode, or at least to the same uh, uh, coupling constants, G1, G2. How do we do that? Uh, the, the ions are slightly oblique, oblique with respect to the cavity axis, and we have a means of shifting the cavity around the ions. So we want to make sure that the ions are really uh, talking to here, at least to neighboring nodes, or the same node. In fact, they are talking to neighboring nodes, but we want to make sure that they have the same coupling strength. And this is assured by moving the cavity with piezo stages around the ions. And you see, this is uh, both ions uh, talking to these nodes, the, the, these different nodes, and they are fairly overlapping, from which we derive that the coupling strength is the same. If there are, we, there are a few wavelengths between them. There are a few wavelengths between them, but then if they are vertically aligned, and there's a, a, the, the, there are about four degrees of, or if you have this, the, the, these angles and you just move the, across, essentially uh, they're vertically about five micron apart, these ions, but laterally it's, it's only one and a half wavelengths. And so when we just move the cavity around it, and this one is in the antinode and this is in the node, then you see immediately from the camera picture that we take that this is different. And of course, in such a situation, we cannot really do this. But I would like to show you only what kind of control we have at this system. And if you have two ions in two different cavities, you would have to do the same thing. <clears throat> With this, we just make sure that these photons are really indistinguishable. Otherwise, you would be able to sort of address the, the photons. You could do that for different things as well. But we make them indistinguishable deliberately in such a way. This is the uh, cavity leg and this is the laser leg. And then we just see the entanglement. <clears throat> and this is how it's analyzed. Essentially, we generate the heralded entanglement of the state by heralding, by just measuring HV or VH uh, from this setup. And then we map for analysis the D prime state to the S state. And then we proceed as usual. We just take our quantum jumps and see what is in the dark and the excited state. And then we measure the parity. The parity is just uh, adding the probability of either finding both in the S or both in the both in the D or both in the S state, or minus the probability of finding them in the odd states. And we find a fidelity in this case of roughly about 92%. This uh, seems to work fine, We're also with the high probability. I'm done in a minute. Uh, the downside, of course, is that the repetition rate due to that um, conditional, uh, condition that we have here is only about uh, 0.2 entanglement events per second. So it takes about five seconds on average to get one entanglement event, which is not that small, considered that uh, we still have a uh, uh, long time, for instance, for key distribution or for entangling atoms. But nevertheless, we can improve on that by going to smaller cavities or to smaller, uh, the higher coupling events. With this, I'm done. So let me just uh, uh, briefly talk about the future goals and developments. We are greedy. We want to go to, to more. We want to go to more ions, longer strings, better fidelities, faster gate operations. I don't have the time to go over all these strategies here. And then, of course, we want to develop also 2D drop arrays, on-board addressing, and you know, you name it. But in my point of view, what really is important, that's why we uh, investigated that so long, is the implementation of error correction. Because eventually, if you really succeed in doing that technically well, that's when you really can keep the qubit alive. That's what I keep a qubit as a, a, the internal spinning top. And once you have achieved that, then, of course, all the rest of that is just an appendix, because this is then engineering. But this is the real physical challenge that we have at this time. With this, I'm done. This is the group that already does the, did the work. These people actually did the real hard work. These are the names. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.
the quantum error correction, right? You said that mm -hmm. uh, part of the reason uh, it did not improve is that the noise was correlated and therefore yes. two qubit errors were more likely than if the noise would have been uncorrelated. Isn't it possible to uh, apply randomizing operations on the qubits during the wait time such as the noise would become uncorrelated? I guess randomized pi pulses could be the work. Uh, <clears throat> in principle what you're asking is there any decoupling scheme possible with which we could actually do it? The difficulty here is that we, we, we've looked into that. It's not clear to me at this time. Um, <coughs> the point simply is the fluctuations that we have in the magnetic field are unfortunately in the same time domain as the time it takes to make these operations. So there is, it's, if you could separate the time scales very much, then you could actually do it. So you could no, but I mean, they, they, if you apply sigma z operations yes. independently to your qubits, they commute with your magnetic field noise, so it doesn't matter. That's right, but you would have to do the sigma z operations much faster than the field fluctuations. Then, why is that though? I mean, all you need to, to do is uncorrelate the operation of noise on the qubits. So you need to apply and you still have the randomized, the randomized. And you still have the error. Z. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. You but always have some probability for two errors. I mean, if the problem is no, but that doesn't, the operation doesn't change the correlation that you have there if you do sigma c operations. I don't see how this works. See, the point of is you can do the dynamical decoupling, but that really would require that you do operations in order to have yeah, to, yeah. to set the time scales. But uh, uh, I have not seen a, a viable way to do this, and also all of the operations that you do. See, my, my philosophy is always, and knowing from the system, it's better to leave these ions alone. Don't ever do anything that you really, don't operate on the ions. Whenever you operate on the ions, you lose. So keep them in the dark. My way out of that would be rather to go for decoherence-free subspace. That's insensitive to magnetic, to magnetic fluctuations. That, that probably is a way out. But at the expense of twice the numbers of ions that you have, we know how to do this. So I, I think we have a way of doing it. It's just technically more demanding. Uh, but uh, dynamically coupling and other measures, I have not seen it at this time. I'd be happy if you come up with an idea. You have the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have uh, further questions over here. Are you sure the 40 ion crystal, what's the lifetime of that crystal? Do you mean the lifetime in the, in the trunk? Yes, is, is it hours or minutes? Hours. That's not, that's not a big deal. The difficulty is, is just to get the same amount of control for 40 ions that we have with 10 or 15 ions. Remember, what we have is usually big traps as compared to yours. So we are not using traps. This is actually done in a surface ion trap. Uh, so this, but this, it's a big one, which is 200 microns above the surface. This is not done uh, in the bigger traps. We have lifetimes of months. Okay, I think there are no further urgent questions, so let's thank Rana again.